All right, well, I'm going to try to, I'm going to have to jump through this real quick so we stay on schedule because I'm, I'm the guy before lunch and uh, I don't want to make any more enemies than I may already have. Uh, the title of my talk is Favorite Fed, Enemy of the State in 11 Years Flat. 1993 is when I began with the IRS. 2004 is when I was indicted by the U.S. Department of Justice. So that's an 11-year period. Or I could also call it Your Worst Nightmare, an Accountant with a Gun. That was our uh, class t-shirt and training. That's a job I did for five and a half years, a special agent with the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. This was a photo taken at the East Palo Alto, California Police Academy. I'm sorry, Citizens Police Academy. This is my family. On your left, uh, my brother John, he's a lieutenant in the California Highway Patrol. My baby brother Jeff is next. He's an officer with the San Jose, California Police Department. Uh, my mother's in the middle, Anne, and my father passed away in 1993, otherwise he would have been in the picture too. Uh, next is my brother Jim. He is a battalion chief in the Daly City, California Fire Department. And then that pencil neck guy over there with the little treasury badge is me. That's my uncle Gary, 30 years with the Santa Clara County, California Sheriff's Office. Well, back when I uh, realized that after having graduated from San Jose State and getting an accounting degree and becoming a certified public accountant, that there's no way that I could continue to be an accountant for you know 30 year career, I decided that I needed a little more excitement in my life and so I applied to both the FBI and the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. Now of course the FBI, at least up until maybe the last 10 or 20 years or so, uh, had a pretty good reputation. I mean, who doesn't want to be an FBI agent? Uh, Sheriff Max talked about his father being an FBI agent and uh, Sheriff Mack maybe having that uh, inkling himself. Uh, but I also had a friend who worked for the IRS for many years and talked to me about the Criminal Investigation Division and their primary claim to fame was having caught Al Capone, or at least they, take, they claim all the credit for it, but uh, I guess they kind of have to hunt around for some credit uh, so that people will like them. Their uh, motto there is, be an accountant with conviction. Anyway, I decided to, uh, long story that I can't get into about why the FBI didn't work out. I did qualify to go to Quantico, Virginia um, to be a FBI special agent, but because of a hiring freeze, I uh, couldn't quite make it. Meanwhile, the IRS contacted me and asked me if I'd be interested in a special agent position in the San Francisco, California office, and I accepted that, and in November of 1993, I was sworn in and uh, went to training, uh, quite an extensive training, about 16 weeks in Glencoe, Georgia. And uh, in case there's uh, any allegations out there that I was just one of those bozo agents who just went sideways, uh, you know, I don't mean this to brag, but just for a little extra evidence that I really took the job seriously and, and worked very hard at it. I achieved a 95% academic average in training. I was the class president of, the training, of both training classes. I received a memorandum of appreciation for my service as president. He described my service as uh, having you know, faithfully discharged the extra duties of being president of the class. So after training, uh, well actually I should say before, before I even went to training, I had an interesting experience that taught me about the culture inside the IRS. Uh, I had no cases to work on because it was my first day, and so I grabbed a copy of the Internal Revenue Code, which they happen to have on my shelf, and if any, anyone's ever seen one, it's pretty darn thick. So I turned to the criminal sections, the 7000 series, and was actually reviewing them, and my boss, uh, Alex, who was a former Marine, he comes and barks at me and says, you know, what are you doing? And I looked up at him and I said, well, I'm just... Uh, researching the statutes that I'm actually going to be investigating and, and you know, seeking prosecution on. And he said, you need to put that book away. You're no longer a CPA, you're an IRS special agent, and you don't need to be looking in that book. He also had a problem with, on my business card, uh, you know, actually when you're a CPA, you're supposed to be able to put it after your name in any correspondence or things like that. So put it on my card and he didn't like that either. So I, I'm not quite sure what was going on there, but something having to do with uh, thinking and uh, researching, things that I did as a CPA prior to going in the IRS, wasn't very welcome there. 
If I had the time, I'd show you all my home videos about my swearing-in ceremony, but I'll just uh, give you just a picture. I, it really meant a lot to me, and um, uh, unlike most IRS swearing-in ceremonies, well, they'll probably have a, a room this size with this many people. Eh, raise your right hand. You know, it's not very serious, but um, it really meant a lot to me, and uh, I've always, uh, I will always know and remember the words that I swore an oath to. And I know that you're all familiar <laughs> with the oath and might be slight changes between uh, federal and state, um, but I'm sure the same wording is, is used, especially there at the end. As far as my, uh, what I would call my pre-enlightenment days at the IRS, when I was in, in the mindset of, I wanna use my financial skills, my training to serve my country, protect the US Treasury, um, I guess about as uh, naive as one could be <laughs> in terms of his goals. But uh, again, just to point out that I, I was not a slug while I worked there, I rose to the highest uh, level of a GS-13 before my fifth year employment anniversary. I earned a Superior Performance Award, a Sustained Superior Performance Award, Top Athlete Award. I was the Asset Forfeiture Coordinator for the Central California District, the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force Coordinator for the Central California District, and a Firearms and Defensive Tactics Coordinator. So you might think that that looks like a rewarding career as an IRS Special Agent. And I consider this my enlightenment process, which I'm gonna have to go through very quickly. But basically, I was uh, an avid listener of talk radio in the San Francisco Bay Area, and a talk show host had this guest, some of you may have heard of her, DV Kidd, and she was talking about the federal income tax and the monetary system and uh, the New World Order and Agenda 21 and all these different kinds of issues. And at that time, I was still like, uh, aren't those people kooks? But uh, I was able to see through that and just listen because this particular host was quite um, provocative. He wasn't about you know, what is, or who is right or wrong, but just what is right or wrong. A very constitutionally minded uh, gentleman named Jeff Metcalf. But after DV Kidd made this presentation about the federal income tax, you know, I, got, I kind of took offense at it. I mean, she said, even said that the federal income tax was largely a voluntary system. And you know, the IRS gave me a six hour nine millimeter and bulletproof vest and shotgun training. And I thought to myself, lady, this tax ain't voluntary. But I kind of looked at myself and I thought, well, okay, I could just pinch myself, but you know, I, I've, I've achieved a certain amount of uh, education and experience and training, and uh, why does the stuff that she said, you know, maybe I should look into it more and use my skills to do so. If she's lying, then I'm an exposer for lying. If she's not lying, then I'm gonna expose whoever is lying. So as any trained investigator would do, I decided I'd use or utilize investigative training to seek out the truth, gather evidence, interview witnesses, present evidence to the appropriate personnel. I did this on my own time. I interviewed people that the IRS called tax protesters. I reviewed more in depth the uh, Internal Revenue Code, Code of Federal Regulations, court cases, and I took a closer look at IRS enforcement. Uh, in the IRS, uh, Book, uh, book booklet, publication 17, it's interesting that they say this publication covers some subjects on which a court may have made a decision more favorable to the taxpayers than the interpretation by the IRS. Until these differing interpretations are resolved by higher court decisions or in some other way, this publication will continue to present the interpretation by the IRS. So this is a report that I uh, prepared basically after about a uh, one and a half to two year period of uh, evenings, weekends, uh, trying to get through this mountain of, of material to determine who was telling the truth. Uh, I put the, some of the highlights of what I had encountered into a report that I uh, entitled Investigating the Federal Income Tax, a Preliminary Report. The allegations. Uh, due to constitutional limitations, most Americans are not required to file income tax returns and pay income tax. 16th Amendment was not ratified, and U.S. government finances its operations through the creation of fiat money, not with revenue from income taxes. I gave the, my supervisors a letter along with my report, uh, and suffice to say, or this particular uh, sentence, if the service declines to conduct its own analysis or dismisses the evidence in this report without proper review, 
then I must tender my resignation. My oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States was made to God, and I cannot serve two masters. Well, to say that uh, my presentation fell on deaf ears would probably be an understatement. I got a, a, a memorandum from my chief, uh, who's now called a special agent in charge. IRS will not be responding to your request and will provide you with the necessary paperwork to tender your resignation. So sample fact, I can't get into all the details, but the average working American is not liable to pay the federal income tax. The law clearly states that only Americans who are liable for the income tax are required to keep records and file returns. And in case you're wondering if the IRS agrees with what the law requires, you might check out their Disclosure, Privacy Act, and Paperwork Reduction Act in the tax booklets. They refer to these sections and say that those sections say that you must file a return or statement with us for any tax you are liable for. So the IRS agrees. Well, after coming to, uh, I had to come to some kind of a conclusion because I really didn't expect to arrive at the conclusion that I did, which was that the IRS was knowingly, at least at the upper levels, knowingly deceiving the American public and stealing their property. And so I had to look at what the IRS's own written policies and principles were in case somehow my uh, upbringing, uh, the ethics that my parents taught me, the ethics of the CPA profession somehow uh, didn't give me enough ammunition as to what to do. I went to look at what the IRS said I should do. And you can see that they taught us, uh, among other things, the core ethical principles. Uh, many of them I'm sure you're very familiar with. I won't go through them. And of course, the words to the oath, which you all have memorized. Well, uh, they, the, they basically gave me an opportunity to either, they didn't fire me, the IRS didn't fire me, but they basically said, hey, come back in a week, we're gonna put you on administrative leave and let us know what your decision is. So I, I thought, you know, I've earned a pretty good reputation here, and one of the things that helps you to <laughs> be believed is having a good reputation. So I didn't want them to tarnish that and I believe that the best uh, thing for me to do was to resign. So I created a, prepared a, a resignation letter, addressed it to Commissioner Rosati, who was the commissioner of the IRS at the time. And again, just to summarize, based on the obvious futility of continuing to work for an agency that has standards and practices so different from what it professes, and standards and practices so contrary to my own, I'm officially resigning from the position of IRS Criminal Investigation Division Special Agent, effective as of the date of this letter. Well, uh, I could also get into the difficulty of once you quit a job cold turkey, uh, which I did, it was difficult financially to support a wife and two children, uh, but with God's uh, grace and blessings, you know, I was able to get back on my feet. Uh, got a website, josephbannister.com, put out the word that, you know, I had some IRS knowledge and also, I guess well, I learned, uh, again, being very naive that the, there weren't too many IRS agents that would take the time to actually look into these matters, let alone speak up about them, let alone resign over them. Uh, so I actually did get some media attention uh, from these uh, media organs and others. I also was a part of an effort by this uh, group called the We the People Foundation for Constitutional Education, and they put out a series of full-page ads in the USA Today. We even were able to obtain from um, Roscoe Bartlett, uh, a congressman from back east in Maryland, uh, to have a truth and taxation hearing. And the Department of Justice, through their representative, Mr. Bryant actually agreed to come and, and participate in this hearing to actually iron out all these issues about exactly who's liable to pay the tax, you know, uh, stacking up the law versus what the IRS does on a daily basis. And uh, this was scheduled to um, occur and it never did. They all backed out of it. You may not have known that, but uh, there's plenty of information about those issues on, on my website. But the bottom line is that the IRS had just about enough of this former special agent asking questions and beating the drum and getting a, you know, a little bit of media attention here and there. So they're one of their answers, I don't have time to get into all their answers. 
But they decided in uh, November of 2004, through the U.S. Department of Justice, to indict me on four federal felony charges. Three charges involving uh, preparation. I prepared false amended income tax returns for a client. And the fourth charge that I conspired with that client to defraud the United States of America. Of course, when they, the IRS, the DOJ do things, the publicity is humongous. So they put out a press release, and uh, my defense attorneys were quite amazed at how, uh, well, they basically convicted me in the press release. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how the uh, innocent till proven guilty concept is uh, ignored with the federal authorities. So again, the alleged crimes allegedly conspired to defraud the United States, preparing false income tax returns. The problem for the IRS was that they trained me too well. That's my defense attorney, Jeffrey Dickstein, and those are the boxes of research. When he decided to represent me, he said, well, you gotta send me all of your research. <laughs> so I bought some stock in FedEx and shipped them. Now the highlights of the trial, uh, again, just to quickly gloss through, hope I still have a few minutes left. Prosecution, they tried to disqualify one of my defense attorneys on the eve of trial. 28-year veteran IRS agent could not point out anything false in these tax returns that they asserted I prepared falsely. And that was, e that was both under cross-examination and direct examination. Prosecution witness after prosecution witness testified that they observed no conspiracy between myself and my client. Prosecution brought forward no evidence of the existence of any conspiracy. Case investigator, a guy I used to work with, testified that he encountered no evidence that the IRS was impeded, impaired, or obstructed. That was part of the charges. In other words, evidence fulfilling the elements of the crime that I was uh, accused of were not even encountered during, during his entire investigation. The defense, uh, our side, called only one witness, and that was my former supervisor at the IRS, Robert Guarini, as a character witness. Not one juror ever voted for conviction during any of the deliberation polling. One of the two prosecutors didn't even show up for the verdict. Okay, well, I, I'm going to try to go through this very quickly. It was really a bizarre uh, circumstance, but there was a prosecutor for the DOJ, Department of Justice, that I used to work with when I worked at the IRS. And I asked him when I met him just on the street in front of the IRS building, if he'd be willing, because he worked in the DOJ, he could actually arrange some kind of a meeting or some kind of communication between myself and anyone in the Department of Justice who could address these very serious issues about the income tax. I didn't find out until the day that he testified in my trial, his name was Tom DeLeonardo, and he wrote to his boss, see where it says to Ronald A. Semino. He wrote to his boss, and uh, interesting, he said a few things that are kind of comical, but he said his associates, meaning me, Joe Bannister's associates are mostly notorious illegal tax protesters who would most assuredly be disruptive and uncooperative. But he also said, if his motives are truly noble and pure, he should be receptive, he being me. Because Joe is currently the most highly publicized member of the illegal tax protester movement, it would serve the government well to show him the error of his views. At the very least, Bannister could no longer argue that the government has refused to, quote unquote, show him the law. Now that was written back in April of 2001. And it was written to the man who was responsible. You see the area in blue? That's the area that that Ronald Semino was responsible for prosecuting or overseeing the prosecution of that entire region of the country. That's how high up in the DOJ the recipient of this email was. And all, what did he ask? He asked that maybe I could meet with someone and discuss these issues. And you see how his underling, Tom, even pointed out, hey, if this guy is full of it, this is our great opportunity to shut him up for good because we'll, we'll, we'll find out that he's just a fraud. Over, 11, or over 10 years later and still no contact. But this came up in my trial, that I had done everything I could to try to get answers to these questions and, and the silence was deafening. That's just a flow chart of how high up uh, Mr. Semino, he actually got promoted after this. 
See the lower square? That's where he used to be, one of those three enforcement sections. Now he's been elevated up the chain, and you can see above him is the assistant attorney general. So he's working his way up. So the verdict of the trial, not guilty on all four counts. Uh, no surprise to me, I had done nothing wrong. I was, and it showed in the trial that I was just absolutely by the book in terms of following IRS procedures for these tax returns I prepared. And there was no conspiracy with this client. It was just a complete, I guess they thought, throw it, you know, throw it up on the wall, see what sticks. Thankfully, nothing stuck. So there was one consolation uh, that, that I got after the uh, verdict of an acquittal. And that was in the media, in the local media, Sacramento Bee, that the verdict was cheered by tax evaders. <laughs> and uh, if there's one thing that I've known, and maybe many of you are already well aware, but uh, the media is complicit in this problem that we face. And we need, to, we need to tell our fellow Americans about this and wake them up, because this is a huge reason why people just don't get it. They have their blinders on. It's thanks to this, uh, media app, these media apparatuses. The bottom line, the federal government is deceiving the American public about their income tax obligation, obligations that results in trillions of dollars of tax paid through deceit, intimidation, and illegal force. Hundreds of billions, if not trillions, are taken illegally. My suggestions for some of the things we can do to fix it, stop demonizing law-abiding citizens who know their rights respect and support citizens who assert their rights. Citizens and law enforcement work together to learn and abide by the boundaries of authority, jurisdiction, etc. Some tools, thank you. Some tools for the toolbox. Uh, I love them. Uh, Sheriff Mack worked hard to get them. And those are the judicial uh, opinions and legal doctrines that he's raised, uh, that he raised in the Brady Bill court cases. And of course, he's spoken about uh, these couple days, uh, he's got lots of materials that uh, has it all in writing, and uh, those materials have been very instructive to me, so I would encourage you to check them out as well. The federal government actually has its own research about the limitations of the federal government. There was a report that was written in 1957 that is absolutely exhaustive and uh, hit, hits, right, hits the nail right on the head in terms of the limitations to federal power. And this is, of course, probably gripes you, it gripes me as well. Uh, who exactly are the kooks? Us who can read the law plainly, read the Constitution plainly, and decide that we're going to honor our oaths and support those who honor their oaths to make sure that we obey those laws in the Constitution? Or those people that point fingers at us and ignore those documents, ignore those obligations, uh, that's who I think the kooks are. I, I uh, suggest that we pray frequently, asking God to heal and bless our country. <laughs> Obey the commandments, and uh, my little pet peeve is refraining from taking the Lord's name in vain in our daily speech. Be a good example, and be a good example to our fellow Americans. I also suggest uh, that you watch your back. I know you're already doing that. Uh, but you know, you might be labeled a terrorist if you support an unanointed political candidate. You can check out the Missouri Information Analysis Report for more information. If you use cash or you enjoy certain movies, or worse yet, if you actually are featured in one. <laughs> the Missouri, the MIAC report included, and I was uh, really had to kind of fell off my chair when I saw that America, Freedom to Fascism, some of you may have heard of the movie, uh, is on the hit list. Or maybe they put an S in front of hit, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's really, really uh, gut-wrenching to find out that uh, simply, um, that movies now are, are on this kind of a hit list. So we really need to watch our backs and watch each other's backs. Parting thought, our oaths were taken with Almighty God as our witness. 
He will strengthen each of us as we honor our promise to well and faithfully discharge our obligation to serve and protect our fellow Americans. And I thank you very much.